Welcome to your History of Photosynthesis lesson. Now, why are we looking at the History of Photosynthesis? This is biology class. Well, because I want you guys to know that science doesn't happen all at once. Science is a gradual process. So it wasn't like some guy woke up someday and said, hey, photosynthesis, this is how it happens. It was actually many, many people over many hundreds of years, actually, that gradually discovered all the little pieces that fit together into photosynthesis as we're going to learn about it in this unit. So let me tell you a little bit about your notes. Right now you have your piece of paper in your notebook. I want you to split that into three sections. On the left you're going to have a smaller section. You're going to write the scientist's name. In the middle you need a bigger section where you're going to talk about it, the experiment and maybe draw a picture of the experiment they did if that's appropriate. And then on the right, you're going to have a third column. And in that column, you're going to write, what did we learn about photosynthesis from that experiment? So for every slide here, you're going to have a scientist, an experiment, and what we learned about it. So our first scientist. Now, this guy actually discovered something really important that I'm sure you've all heard of, which is called gas sylvester or maybe you know it as carbon dioxide. Now, his name was Jan von Helmont, and as you can see, he lived in the 1500s. Um, he was kind of a quirky guy. He had a lot of strange ideas about how the world worked, but he also made a really important discovery. Um, he did discover carbon dioxide. He didn't know how important it was. His discovery actually had to do with trees and plants and where their mass came from. So he grew a willow tree in a pot. And this experiment we're going to talk about was one of the few, like very first quantitative experiments, which means it was one of the very first experiments where someone actually carefully measured um, the quantities, the things that went into it, and used numbers to analyze the experiment as opposed to just general observations. So he used numbers. Um, nowadays, of course, we always use numbers in experiments, but he was one of the first to do so. So he put his willow tree in a pot, and it was a lovely willow tree, and he very carefully measured how much the tree weighed, and he measured how much the dirt that he put in the pot weighed. And the very first day, he had a five-pound tree and 200 pounds of dirt. Then he carefully watered his tree every day, and that's all he did was water it and he didn't add anything else to the pot or the tree, and he let it grow. So, as you might imagine, over time it grew quite big, and after five years, yes, he was a very patient man, had a very long experiment, after five years his willow tree in his pot had grown quite large, so he took out the tree, he took out the dirt, he weighed it all very carefully, and he found out that he had a tiny bit less dirt than he started with. So he lost like a tenth of a pound of dirt, but he had a whole lot more tree. He had 169 pounds of tree. Now the only thing he had done to this tree the entire time was water it. So quite logically, he concluded that the tree was made of water, that that was what had turned into all of the leaves and the wood was the water because it was the only thing he added to the pot. Now, yeah, we know now that it wasn't the whole picture, but still it was a start. Remember, this is a step-by-step -step process. All right, our next guy also discovered an important gas. Uh, you may not know it as deflogisticated air. Nowadays we call it oxygen. Um, but again, he didn't know the importance of his discovery. Sometimes discoveries uh, don't see, seem so important at the time. But our next guy, Joseph Priestley, who did actually um, do some work as a pastor for a while, so his name wasn't entirely inappropriate. Uh, Joseph Priestley did a very important experiment involving candles and some dead mice. So he noticed that a candle, if you put it into a closed container, just like if you put a mouse in a closed container, both of them would die. The candle would go out if you put it in the closed container, and the mouse, yes, he abused mice, poor mouse, 
uh, if you put a mouse in a closed container, it would die. Now, we know, yes, the mouse ran out of air, but he didn't really know what was in the air. Remember, he had just barely discovered oxygen at the time. We didn't know all the components of air. So what he thought was both mice and candles did something to break the air, to injure it, to make it not useful anymore. But then he did a second experiment and found out that if he took a plant and he put it in the container with his mouse, the mouse actually would survive, it wouldn't die. So he concluded, since the plant made it so the mouse didn't die, that the plant could somehow repair the air that had been injured by the mouse. So his important discovery here was that animals, and also candles, basically did a process that was the opposite of whatever plants did. So we now know these as photosynthesis and respiration. But this was a big discovery at the time, that plants and animals were sort of opposites of each other, that something was happening with plants that fixed whatever animals caused. Then, of course, you know. I think we should have stuck with deflogisticated air. I think it has a much nice, nicer ring to it. But, you know, oxygen's okay, too. Okay, so now we know that air gets injured by animals, gets restored by plants. What happens next?